to record. Okay, go ahead. All right, great. So uh, Mel has been talking about Sidon sets and adapting this Bose construction several talks this semester, uh, adapting the Bose construction to other scenarios. Uh, and there's another construction of Sidon sets, singers, that's stronger and nobody uses it because it's not really written up very well anywhere. Uh, so maybe I will uh, add to the unwell descriptions of it today, or maybe it'll be a little better. Okay, so here's some notation uh, in the form that I like it. Uh, for A being a set of positive integers, uh, A star is the representation function. Uh, and the star is kind of reminiscent of convolution. Uh, and it is a convolution of the indicator function of the set. And A circ uh, is the correlation. Uh, so this sort of uh, invites one to use Fourier analysis on the problems and you don't need to have new letters for things. Um, all right, so just to uh, bring everybody onto the same page. Uh, this is how we can define a Sidon set uh, or a Golem ruler or a B2 set. They're all the same thing, different names for the same thing. Um, Condition four is kind of the one that uh, that's most common. A star k is at most two. That is the May I ask number a of weights. Yes, please, sir. What does that mean? A is the Golomb ruler. Uh, so uh, the following are equivalent, right? So being a Golomb ruler is the same thing as being a Sidon set. Uh, Golem was an electrical engineer and he independently discovered these and there's a literature in uh, recreational math where they call these Golem rulers and uh, they put a tremendous amount of computational effort into computing uh, optimal Golem rulers that are longer and longer. They're up to like 27 element sets at this point. Uh, but it's exactly the same thing as a Sidon set. Um, the, the recreational description is that uh, if you had a ruler and the marks were placed in this pattern, uh, you would still be able to measure uh, a lot of different differences. So they, oh. they want the, the differences to be distinct. Um, so this is the one that's, uh, that people usually use. It's that every number K can be written as a sum in at most two ways. Uh, the two is just three plus five is the same thing as five plus three. So. This A star function counts those separately, so we get the two. Um, so if we don't have solutions to A plus B equals C plus D, then we also don't have non-trivial solutions to A minus D equals C minus B. Uh, and that phrases like this, once you parse out what non-trivial uh, means, that uh, for every K except zero, uh, it can only be written as a difference in at most one way. Uh, since those are equivalent, we could put them together uh, and say that uh, A star plus A circ is at most three. And this is getting closer to what Sidon was actually looking at. Uh, Sidon's actual, the, th the reason that what he was doing where this came up was part eight. So, uh, part seven is just standard generating function stuff, right? When you square a polynomial, you, uh, you're adding in the exponents. So you're just counting the representations. Uh, this amplitude thing is a little bit different, right? The, uh, when you square it, uh, your cosine A is cosine B and trig identities can turn that into a cosine A plus B, uh, but you also get a cosine A minus B. So the sums and differences are coming up in the frequencies and the amplitudes are counting something connected to this. Uh, I think this is uh, actually A star K over two plus A cert K is the coefficient of cosine KZ. Okay, so um, I mentioned all of these because they're, uh, they lead to different generalizations. Right. As soon as you, as you relax this and say A star is at most uh, bounded, 
my internet connection is getting a little bit scratchy. Uh, and if you let uh, a circ be at two, then a star could be unbounded. Um, as far as I know, this and this haven't really been generalized. People haven't been looking at those problems uh, for no good reason, just that it's kind of buried in the prehistory of the subject. Um, and then, of course, the names evoke different things, little rulers and B2 sets. Uh, OK, so move on. Uh, so I'm going to be talking mostly about constructions. But before I get into that, let me just cover the other end and remind people what's going on uh, in the upper bound. How thick can one of these sets be? Uh, so the original erdos turan paper back 1941 or 1942, um, they used this property, that if the differences are distinct, you don't even need all the differences to be distinct, just the ones between one and n to the three-fourths. Uh, if all of those are distinct, then the size of the set is at most this. They gave it, uh, they expressed this in a little bit weaker form, but their proof gives this if you're meticulous enough with uh, the calculus. Uh, sometime later, I'm not even sure of the date of this. I want to say 1970, give or take. Uh, Lindstrom uh, gave a very elementary argument uh, that I always thought of as being essentially the same argument. Um, but uh, something happened last month that makes me think otherwise. Uh, and technically what he has is that if we arrange the, uh, if we give notation to the set in increasing order, um, and we look at the differences of elements that are close by in the list, uh, and if those are distinct, just the ones that are really close, uh, then you get the exact same bound that Erdős and Turan got. So if you, why did I think this was the same? Right? So uh, if you take A to be a, a nice thick Sidon set, then K is going to be about root N. Uh, that means that the average gap between consecutive elements in A is also going to be about, well, N over root N, root N. And if we're looking at ones that are into the one quarter apart and the average gap is into the one half, that gives us a, an expected gap size of around into the three fourths, uh, which comes in right exactly where the fully optimized erdos turan argument gave. So they're trading on essentially the same information. Um, the internal mechanics are simplified a little bit. erdos turan uses uh, cauchy schwartz inequality. Lindstrom is just more basic than that. Uh, but uh, about a month ago, uh, Furedi, Balog, and there's a third one, a third author. Roy. Roy, R O Y? R O Y, yeah. There He's we a go. graduate student. Oh, great. Um, gave that uh, if A is a Sedon set, uh, then A is, the size of A is at most into the one half plus 0 0.98 into the one quarter. Uh, and I think that's for sufficiently large N. Okay. And I haven't really processed their article at this point. Uh, but I think they found a way to triage that these, the information being traded on is slightly different in the two cases. Uh, so if the small differences are dis, are really packed tightly, then one of these arguments is better. And if they're really spread out, then one of the other ones is better. Variational. Uh, actually, this is, should be an advertisement uh, in this seminar next week. Uh, somebody will be... Uh, uh, and I don't have the name. Uh, somebody will be presenting uh, this argument discussion around it. OK. All right, so uh, constructing Sidon sets. Um, the most obvious way to construct a Sidon set is you just start with one, and then you, you be greedy. You include the next thing that you possibly can. Um, and the question that one would like to ask is, how fast does ASABIN grow? Uh, and uh, that's unknown. In fact, the uh, the trivial upper and lower bounds are, as far as I know, still the best. 
Um, so, I'll say that. Uh, so, a sub n needs to be at least like n squared, and then the forbidden elements you get. Uh, let me phrase it like this. Each triple of, of elements from up to a sub n minus one forbids something, uh, forbids two things, two or three things. Um, so you end up with a cubic list of exclusions. Worst case, you have to go out past that. Um, and for instance, although billions of terms of this greedy Cedon sequence have been computed, it's very irregular. Uh, and uh, it's 33, for instance, has yet to appear as a difference. Um, but we have no way of showing that it won't come up later on. Uh, so those are open questions. Uh, yeah, said so seems like a, uh, a great question. And then absolutely nothing useful has been said about it, uh, except here's the first billion elements, there's billion terms. All right, so moving up in sophistication, there's the erdos turan construction. Uh, I don't want to spend too much on it because it's worse than the others, but it has a very different flavor from the others. So I don't, it's still out there because it's, uh, because it feels so different. And maybe there's some way to fix it, to make it comparable with the others. Uh, and I've got, well, you can read the description as well as I can. Um, we have this, uh, this large scale factor, right? It's just a multiples of 2p. Uh, and then from that arithmetic progression, we perturb it a little bit with squares mod p. So this box x is just reducing to the least positive residue mod p. So this is almost like a, a progression with a little randomness thrown in. Uh, if you, uh, it's completely appropriate to give that this is a Sidon set to your undergraduate number theory students. You just kind of follow the first thing you would do, and it works. Right? Uh, if it wasn't a, some, a Sidon set, then you would have an equation like this and look at the terms, reduce mod p minus one, and so on. Um, okay, so it's a, well, there we are. For better or worse, I don't want to spend more time on it. I want to get to the more, uh, what I consider to be the more interesting constructions. Um, we have uh, what I called, I wrote a bibliography back uh, 15 years ago, uh, and it's a hot bibliography, which means that it's continuously updated, except that I haven't updated it in 15 years. Uh, so it's a very cold, hot bibliography. Uh, and in there, I called this the, the, the Rouge um uh, in one of uh, Humor Rouge's papers, he, he throws it out almost as just sort of an afterthought. Uh, and I don't know if it's original to him. And uh, as far as I know, that's the, uh, the earliest place I've actually seen it. Uh, so here's how it goes. You know, let P be an odd prime, theta a primitive root. And you define the kth term in the sequence. They're not going to be an increasing order. Uh, but A sub K. satisfies these two congruences. Uh, the moduli are obviously relatively prime, so the Chinese remainder theorem uniquely determines A sub K uh, in that range. And uh, again, it's uh, once you have the set defined, uh, that's where the creative moment is. Um, if you follow through what it would mean if it wasn't a Sidon set, then it just kind of works out. Elementary number theory, undergraduate level, Stuff, right? But it's a, a beautifully simple construction. The short line here, um, let me compare the erdos turan construction, right? If we take the size of the set, p minus one, and we square it, we get uh, what p squared minus 2p, blah, blah, blah. And the maximum element could be as big as 2p squared. And so it's substantially less. Uh, here, in the Rouge construction, we get p minus one elements again. Uh, if we square it, we've got p squared and the largest term is also p squared with lower order terms. So it's right in the right ballpark. Um, 
but uh, a full P below. Uh, yeah, okay, so um, I also don't wanna to spend too much time on that, but this is the simplest construction, I think, that gives the asymptotically correct order of magnitude. Uh, for at least some values of n, we can take a Sidon set whose size is root n plus a small uh, a small fix. Uh, kind of a interesting little bit of a commentary to start thinking about with these uh, is that which n can we can we use here? And it depends on the distribution of primes. If there's a big gap in primes, then there might be a big gap in the ends that we can apply to this construction and get something close to root n out of. For okay, small so numbers, you, for small numbers, you actually know the best you can do, right? How does this compare with the best you can do? Um, uh, this, uh, well, how does it compare? Uh, this Ruja construction uh, is, uh, doesn't seem to be as good as the very best. Uh, so if we're talking about like, you know, taking uh, what P to be 17, say, right. uh, this is gonna be three or four smaller than the actual optimal. Uh, don't quote me on that number. That's my, my sense from on a lot of computations of the stuff. So it's, I'm pretty sure in the right neighborhood. Um, so, you know, we're talking about 16 or 19 elements or, or maybe 20 elements. Um, so it's not that big of a change, uh, but again, 17 isn't really very large. Uh, right, did that answer your question, Moisha? Yeah. Some idea yeah, of it? Yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, so, so uh, this set, uh, the size of the set is actually smaller than the square root of the largest element. Uh, and it is conjectured by, uh, well, I guess I should say it is, uh, Erdős asked the question, uh, if it's possible to always take for every n uh, a Sidon set with at least root n elements. Uh, so this doesn't answer Erdős's question, even for the special value. Okay. Uh, okay, so those shallow construction, this was uh, described in, in uh, beautiful detail by Mel uh, a week ago or two weeks ago. Um, I have a little bit different way of expressing it. And so uh, this is where I can start adding something beyond what's in uh, maybe beyond what's in the literature. Uh, um, so here's our setup. Q is a prime power. Uh, and we look at uh, the finite field with Q squared elements. Uh, its multiplicative group is cyclic. Take a theta that generates it. And for each A in, in FQ, uh, we let A prime be the exponent. So I'm making some connection between A and A prime, right? between any Latin letter and its prime. Uh, and so theta A prime goes, th the powers of theta go through the whole finite field, uh, except zero. And one theta is, you know, one comma theta is a basis uh, for, what fq squared over fq. Um, so eventually we hit every element that's like this, uh, one times theta plus a. Uh, so for each a, there is an a prime like this. And if we take those a primes, it is, it is a Sidon set and more than that, uh, because we're how we're defining this in the exponent, it's a Sidon set modulo Q squared minus one, because the exponents are behaving modulo Q squared minus one. Uh, <clears throat> and we get Q different elements. All right, so uh, the proof 
And this is not different from what Mel was saying a week or two ago, but not everyone was here, and, uh, and the reasoning is maybe a little bit different. Um, so if not, uh, then we would have an A prime plus B prime equals C prime plus a D prime. Uh, and I'll go ahead and say mod Q squared minus one. Uh, then I could raise theta to these. C prime plus D prime. And now that's a, uh, these expressions are in the field. Right? So, uh, I, and of course I can factor that our exponents still work how we, how they always have. And by our definition of this priming option, priming uh, notation, uh, this means theta plus A times theta plus B equals theta plus C times theta plus D. Uh, and here's where we're going to go a little bit different from how Mel thought of this. Uh, if we multiply this out, but keeping theta as, treating it like it's a variable, c plus d theta plus c d, uh, and we look at the difference of the two sides, right? So if we move everything over to one side, the difference uh, is linear in theta and one theta, sorry, one comma theta is a base basis. Uh, and so we get a linear combination of one and theta being zero. That means that the coefficients have to be zero, which means that this polynomial, that these two polynomials are the same. The coefficients are the same. Uh, but we have two different factorizations of this. We have two factorizations. And unique factorization So the two the sets of factors, theta plus A, theta plus B equals that. Now, it's, uh, I should pause for a moment to, uh, uh, of course, we don't quite have unique factorization, right? We always say unique factorization, but it's not what we mean, right? It's, uh, it's unique up to the order. Uh, and also uh, constant factors we can slide around. You know, you can multiply one by two. You multiply one factor by two and the other factor by uh, the inverse of two. Um, so we don't really have that going on here because these are linear. Uh, so uh, sorry, I uh, slipped back into theta world. So we have unique factorization up to the order into linear factors. Um, and that means that AB equals CD. And that means I almost left the exact right amount of space that uh, the primed things since the connection between the letters and the primes, the primed versions were the same, uh, because that connection is unique, we can scale back up to the primes, primed version of the letters. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so there we are. I hope that's uh, that's clear. There's a little bit different uh, viewpoint um, than was had before. Uh, and let me highlight something. If we square the size of the set, 
it is now slightly bigger than its largest element, guaranteed to be bigger than the largest element. Uh, so this answers uh, this question of Erdos and Tehran. Can we, uh, for each n, is there a Cidon set contained in the interval from one to n uh, with the size of, I should write it instead of saying it. Let's see, for each n, is there a Cidon set contained in interval to one to n with elements? And so this gives us an infinite sequence of n's for which the answer is yes. Uh, but in between, not so much. Okay, so here's uh, how this is applied more generally, right? So if I give you an N, like say 200, I find a prime power that gives me a Q squared minus one being smaller than N. Then I use this Bose construction, I get Q element Cidon set, and I just forget that it's a modular Cidon set altogether, and I've uh, I've got well Q elements up to n, but Q is going to be a little bit less than the square root of n. Uh, we can try and get around that a little bit, and this is something that hasn't been adequately exploited in. Since this construction and Singer's construction, which I'll start talking about in just a second, give us a modular Cidon set, uh, we can dilate the set and we can shift the set. So we can dilate the set, we can shift it. Uh, and it would be nice how big are the gaps in in that, right? So um, when we forget the modular part, uh, we really care about what the largest element of that set is. And we can make it smaller if we arrange for a big gap in the set to happen right at the end. Right? The set doesn't have to go up to Q squared minus one. And we can always arrange for the average gap as size Q. Uh, so we can arrange for a gap at the end and actually have the largest element be Q squared minus Q. Uh, and that kind of thing will reduce our dependence on the distribution of primes a little bit. Um, it's still not really going to kill the problem, but uh, we'll do something. Okay, so now on to the Singer construction, which was the, the, the thing I really, really wanted to get that everyone avoids for no good reason. All right, so we, uh, here's our setup. Q is a prime power. We take theta uh, to generate FQ cubed, the multiplicative group of FQ cubed. Uh, and for each A in FQ, we have our A prime, same as before. Uh, Every element like this will have some A prime. So the connection between A and A prime is settled and it's, and it's good. Uh, we can take A prime to be in this interval, really A prime, we should think about it as a congruence class modulo Q squared minus one. Um, and A bar uh, is the congruence class. We can drop it down from being Q cubed minus one to one plus Q plus Q squared. Uh, and here is the punchline. Uh, if we look at these reduced versions. I, I did not understand what it means to, to drop it down to one plus Q plus Q squared. I missed okay, the sense so, of that. Yeah, so um, one plus Q plus Q squared divides Q cubed minus one, right? So, so uh, uh, So our A prime is living like naturally as an exponent on theta. 
So it's naturally a congruence class modulo q cubed minus one. Uh, but I can take a divisor of the modulus and get a, a, uh, a, smaller, a smaller maximum element. I'm losing a little bit of the, of the connection to the finite field structure that I'm going to have to recover in the proof. This divides q cubed minus 1. Uh, OK, so we get this. Uh, and now note, if we take the size of A and we square it, uh, we're ending up not just a hair above our maximum element, but a full Q above it. Uh, and we can get another Q by arranging for the gaps. Um, but I don't really know how to arrange the gaps perfectly. Um, OK. All right. so. Uh, how does this go? So uh, a few observations. Uh, observations. Um, so one theta and theta squared is a basis uh, for fq cubed over fq. Um, okay. Uh, FQ, uh, we can take it to be um, X times Q squared plus Q plus one, uh, where zero is X less than Q. No, less than. Okay. Uh, and so we're getting uh, uh, FQ is contained, obviously, uh, in FQ cubed, uh, but we have it exactly where it is. Um, <clears throat> and one more thing uh, if theta to the X. And theta to the y are linearly dependent. So a linear combination of them with fq coefficients uh, is 0. Uh, you can rearrange that to get an element of uh, fq, a ratio being that, uh, which we've seen. Uh, then x is congruent to y. Q squared plus Q plus one. Okay. So this is standard finite field stuff, but uh, if you don't use them day in, day out, maybe you don't recall. That's linearly dependent right, over. So over FQ. And now in the previous line, FQ, where's zero? Um, sorry? Ah, OK, thanks. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, OK, so uh, suppose uh, that A is not a Sidon set, that A is not Sidon. Uh, then we have what, uh, a, par, a bar plus B bar congruent to C bar plus D bar. Um, I'm going to express this as being mod Q squared plus Q plus 1. Uh, <clears throat> uh, then we can take uh, theta to these. So we get theta to the, uh, yeah, how do I want to do this? Um, yeah. Uh, hold on a second. So I, uh, Uh, 
All right, so let me, uh, for the sake of exposition, because I don't have my notes handy, I'm traveling, uh, let's look at it as a set, just a set of integers. Um, so if a bar plus b bar equals c bar plus d bar, then we can raise our theta to these. And let me go ahead and factor, if I can write, there we are, b bar is theta, c bar, theta to the d bar. Um, <clears throat> Oh, hold on, I'm so uncomfortable. This made sense when I was preparing. So we get a theta to the A, theta to the B, theta to the C, theta plus D. Um, you made some sort of jump yeah. here, I'm pretty sure, because the bars yeah. are not the primes. Yeah, um, so suppose A is not Sidon. Uh, and there's another thing I want to say. Uh, I want to break this into two cases, certainly. Uh, with A bar, B bar, C bar, D bar, uh, not zero. I want to handle zero uh, last. Um, okay. So, uh, what do I have? Okay. Crap. All right. So let's see. What are my What am I trying to get out with this thing? Um, so, since, all right, let me erase this also. Let's see where. Since theta to the A bar plus B bar equals theta to the C bar plus D bar. Uh, that is a linear dependence. Uh, just going the wrong way. So what I'm trying to get to, let me write this down here and I'll try and get down to it. I want a theta plus A, theta plus B equals some constant in the field, theta plus C, we call that alpha, times theta plus D. I'm gonna suggest K. Yeah, what was that, Moisha? I was going to suggest K, but it doesn't matter. I, you know, as long as it's yeah. not clear that it's not A. Um, yeah, and you need to pass from the bars to the primes, right? That's the. Uh... Um, yeah, well, um, uh, yes, I do. Uh, so. I mean, that looks very reasonable, right? Because the primes are mod. Uh, one plus Q plus Q squared and uh, and uh, yeah. When you change from a bar yeah, to a prime, you just has to be a factor from FQ. Yeah. Thank you. And that factor from FQ is what's generating uh, is taken care of by the alpha. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. We're getting a linear. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> Okay. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Are we, is this uh, intelligent to hear? I mean, I, I, I certainly believe in this. Yes. I mean, I, yeah. yeah, no, it's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so again, as before, uh, if uh, we move this all over to one side, so move to one side, 
uh, expand. Uh, and we get, since one theta and theta squared are a basis, uh, and we just are getting those terms, one theta and theta squared and one theta, well, not one, alpha. Uh, it's all gets multiplied by alpha, but we still get our terms theta squared and theta and the constant term. Uh, since those are a basis, uh, uh, we're having a linear combination being zero. Each of the coefficients has to be zero, which means that these polynomials are actually equal. The x plus a, x plus b, and alpha, x plus c, x plus d, uh, from which we get that alpha has to be one. Um, therefore, alpha equals one. Um, and our set of factors, again, have to be the same factors, uh, whence uh, A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime, uh, and uh, more to the point, the bars are equal. I guess I should have jumped to that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so we get a, a little bit of extra help here because we have a degree three extension uh, so I don't have to worry about the lead terms canceling the way that we did in the Bose construction. Um, so I left out this uh, this case. What if what if one of these is zero? Um, and I left it out, but it's kind of the easy case, All right? So um, now say uh, a bar plus b bar equals c bar. Uh, then, as before, clumsily, but we got there. Uh, we end up with uh, equals alpha times theta plus c. And, um, well, uh, we see that this just can't happen because right? the theta squared terms don't work out in the basis. Okay, so that's Sidon's, uh, sorry, that's the Singer construction for Sidon sets. Uh, do I have, yeah, I've got a few minutes, okay. Um, it's avoided, I think, because, uh, you know, in part because Singer's, so Singer's paper is like 40 pages long. And his effort was he wanted a way to enumerate a, the points in a projective plane where you could answer questions uh, quickly, like uh, is point 0.382 and 109 collinear? Or is the line through 3 and 7, uh, it intersects the line through 50 and 91, but what's the intersection point? So he was looking for ways to, to uh, handle that kind of uh, arithmetic on a, on a projective plane. Uh, and then this just kind of is buried in there somewhere as uh, here's a good property that gives us uh, it helps us to determine in projective planes. Uh, this is this is essentially what we're looking at. It's a particular line in the space. Um, this is based on, like the Bose set, it's based on unique factorization into monic polynomials, but we also have unique factorization into polynomials where the lead coefficient is two or the lead coefficient is seven. Uh, we have lots of ways of taking a collection of linear polynomials where we have unique factorization into them. And each of them gives us a, another Sidon set. Um, uh, so Sergey is asking, so is it known that for some primes P, uh, P uh, there is a Sidon set of size P minus one or P on a segment of size P squared minus CP log P. Um, uh, So the, the bound there uh, is that uh, there exists A contained in one N, uh, Sidon. 
with uh, size of A uh, greater than N to the one half minus N to the uh, I'm going to put five sixteenths, but that's almost certainly been improved. That's uh, based on the result that uh, there's a prime between P and P minus P to the alpha. And whatever that alpha is, we get an alpha over two here. Um, and that's the best known. Um, and that's this error term, which is the best known, is exactly because all of these constructions, the Roja construction, the Bose construction, the Singer construction, they're based on finite fields. Uh, and we only have a few finite fields, right? Only for prime powers. Um, it would be good if we had a way to build Sidon sets uh, that, that didn't rely on finite fields. And I would like to outline uh, with my last you know, few minutes um, a route that I, uh, that I can't carry to completion uh, but I've got some reason to believe that, that it can be completed. Uh, it's just that I haven't been clever enough. Uh, okay, so here's the setup. Uh, take some space X. Let's normalize it so it has measure, has measure one. Uh, let's take an E in there. Uh, Say the measure of E is one over root N. Uh, and let's take T, mapping X into X, and I at least want ergodic. Now I'm not an ergodic theorist or a dynamical systems person, so uh, uh, and that's kind of my, uh, it's kind of the trouble. Uh, and here's what I want to, to take as my set. Uh, A uh, is gonna be a set of Ns So oh, up to n, uh, where tn x naught. So let me build that into my notation. A sub x naught uh, is in E. So just looking at the hitting times for some point x naught, when does it hit into this? So the ergodicity part is there to make sure that uh, For almost all x naught, uh, a sub x naught has size about root n. Okay, uh, so it's got the right size, uh, but why would this be, uh, why would something like this possibly give a Sedon set? Um, and here's the part that I can't quite find the right phrasing for. Um, so I want to uh, assume that T mixes strongly. Uh, and I know mixing is a technical term. I don't mean it in the technical sense. I mean it in the following sense. Oops. Uh, mixes strongly. Uh, that is, uh, if A and B are with an E cross E, then T to the K A, T to the K B is not an E cross E uh, unless K is large. Right. So what is that? Why is that mixing, right? So we start out with two points in here, A and B that landed, and then we jump we apply T to these, and maybe one of them stays in. Uh, and we apply T again, and we apply T again. And if it's strongly mixing, it shouldn't bring them together too often. Uh, and it certainly shouldn't bring them both together inside E very often. Uh, all right. Uh, why does that mean that it's a Sudon set? Um,
Well, why indeed? I just uh, I just said right. So um, when we jump forward a hundred times and we both land back in here. Uh, that's giving us four elements of our Sidon set, the A, the B, and the T to the 100, you know, A plus 100 and B plus 100. That's giving us 100 as a difference in two different ways. So this is exactly the right thing to, to create a Sidon set. Uh, now that would all be very fanciful and, uh, okay, yeah, whatever, Kevin, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Uh, but let me be a little more specific. Uh, let's take a zero one cross zero one. The the I mean this is the torus. Uh, and here's a matrix four one two two. You'll notice that the determinant of t is not one. That means something to ergodic theory people. It means that it uh, mixes in the technical senses of mixing. Uh, and let me just just take a particular x naught, 0, 1 over 17, just to make computations nice. Um, so here we are at x0, and I put a 0 there. And tx0 is uh, uh, what, 1 over 17, comma 2 over 17. Uh, so that's here, and I put a 1. And then multiply by t again, I get here. Multiply by t again, I get here. Um, let me shift to sharing a different thing. Um, and that by computer. All right, here we go. Uh, here is this map that I just described. And if you take as your e, uh, any horizontal bar uh, of size uh, what, one seventeenth. Uh, so this is going out to you know, two hundred and eighty nine points, two hundred and eighty eight points, I guess. Uh, since I didn't put anything at zero zero, there's a zero. Here's our one. Uh, if you look at any horizontal slab, it is a Sidon set. Uh, except for the very bottom one, which is actually an arithmetic progression, all jumbled up. Uh, the very first column is also an arithmetic progression, jumbled up, but every other column is a Sidon set. Um, so, let me just uh, put that in, right? If our, our slab is here, that's the E, uh, then we do actually get a Sidon set. Um, this is kind of, uh, I tricked it out. Uh, if you think about what's happening in the algebra in a finite field, uh, it's very much like multiplying by a matrix. Uh, and this is actually Bose's construction for uh, P equals 17 and a particular generator uh, of the multiplicative group. Um, but have you tried it? Have you tried it for something that isn't the prime power and uh, seen what happens? Uh, yes. And? Um, and uh, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes uh, I get chunks like uh, you know, big rectangles or big slabs that are almost Sidon if I only kick out one or two elements. Uh, but most of the time I don't. Most of the time it's just a jumble and, and you take your E and it looks like a random set of integers and it has too many collisions. Uh, but so do you think there's a, a, a sort of positive probability of it's working, something like that? Um, well, I found examples where it works. So that suggests a positive probability, uh, but it's a pretty weak suggestion of positive probability. Um, what's missing is that uh, I think what, what's going on is that some T's work much better than others. Um, and if you just write down, uh, so I was using this matrix 4, 1, 2, 2. Uh, if you just write down some other matrix, it just doesn't seem to work. Uh, but 
but occasionally there are matrices that work. Um, all right, so, uh, so there we go. That's my hope for, uh, or at least a, a suggestion for how we might be able to get away from talking about finite fields. Like this finite field multiplication is really talking about orbits in a torus. Uh, and so maybe orbits in some other space or different orbits uh, will, will save the day. Uh, all right, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Kevin? Well, may I clarify my question? So, uh, we have seen some constructions of, uh, of about P elements in a certain set such that uh, the set is located, say, on the segment from 1 to P square, right? Yes. Uh, but it can happen that accidentally, actually, the set can be located on a smaller segment, say from 1 to p square minus 10p. And, uh, is it known something about yes. that phenomenon or not? Uh, so if you have a prime p, uh, mm -hmm. you have some freedom to, to choose a primitive root, yes? Yeah, there's a, there's, there's a lot of freedom, right? So you, so you yes, can my... choose the primitive root, you can choose your set of uh, monic polynomials that you're factoring into. Um, I mean, they don't have to be monic. You can choose, uh, you know, I was using theta plus a, but it, it could also be uh, a times theta plus two uh, is also going to work. So there's a lot of freedom. Um, people have looked at for the Bose construction, uh, how much freedom you actually have. And there are results like uh, it actually doesn't matter uh, if which generator of the uh, finite field you take uh, if you're allowed to dilate the set at the end. So choosing different ones just uh, amounts to dilating and, and shifting. Yes, yes, I see. Yeah. Um, it is, it is an, another way to to try to to do the same, to, to dilate and transform it. Or, yeah. Or to change a primitive root. Yes, but it is known that we can win something or not. Uh, so as far as I know, all anybody has ever done on the end is say that you have to have a gap that's at least as big as the average, and you rotate that to the end. The gap? Uh, the gap between consecutive elements. And so, uh, so that gives you, uh, uh, you know, you get to knock P off of your upper bound for the largest element in the set. P or P minus one or P plus one, depending on where you're at. Well, maybe his question should be, is there a very thin set of P where you can do better? Using, in, using peculiar properties of the particular prime to allow a bigger gap. Mm -hmm. But not, not for all prime. You're saving a P, you're saving the factor of P you save for all prime. So let me say something about uh, James Singer, um, whose paper we were more or less uh, uh, considering. Uh, so Singer was a guy who actually spent his career at Brooklyn College. So he was in principle, at least a uh, colleague of some of us. Though in his, he wrote a PhD thesis at Princeton on three-dimensional topology and wrote a paper on that. And then five years later, he wrote a, this paper on number theory. And that was basically the last research paper uh, uh, he wrote. But his paper, is, it's not, as Kevin said, 40 pages long. It's only nine pages long. And mm -hmm. the proof of his theorem is in the second or third page. Uh, but it's not, um, as Kevin described it, uh, sorry, what Kevin described was not Singer's theorem. So Singer's theorem is a theorem in finite projective geometry. And, um, and it's about projective geometry and some application to construct perfect difference sets. And so it's very interesting. And actually, 
I had hoped when I asked uh, Kevin to talk about this is that he would explain the projective geometry because that's something we don't hear about very much. Uh, in finite, uh, in combinatorics, there's a huge subject about finite projective planes, but, uh, but and in fact, the title of Singer's paper is a theorem in finite projective geometry in some applications to number theory. And I guess the reason is not referred to so much is that as a consequence of what he does, you learn something about sit on sets of order two and Bose and Chawla uh, saw sort of like the algebraic bit behind Singer's theorem and construct a sit on sets of order H for all H. But it's uh, just from the point of view of um, seeing mathematics yes, that you're not usually um, uh, familiar with applied to problems that you are familiar with. Uh, it's just very interesting to go back. It goes back to like 1938, uh, I think when this paper was published, but it's a paper in finite projective geometry. And um, my impression is that um, except in this sort of, uh, people don't really study projective geometry. I mean, every, everything is living in projective spaces, you know, you, you know, you, but, um, but the finite projective geometry is really very interesting. And from a combinatorial point of view, this paper of Singer is, um, is quite nice. And um, so. All right. Uh, uh, well, yeah, I, I found it a, a, a hard read. Um, to answer Misha's question about, uh, and, and ties into something Mel just said, right? So the Singer construction can also give uh, sets whose h-fold sums are distinct, right? It's a, uh, you just need to up the degree a little bit so that you can handle three factors at once and still be contained in a basis. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Because I thought, yeah, I mean, when I saw the argument, I thought this is now, uh, this is the argument about the projective plane and then you probably can do the same thing in, 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 this, in projective spaces of higher dimension, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take the projective plane in Q cubed, you have Q cubed minus one over Q minus one point. So that's your Q squared plus Q plus one. And, he, and what Singer is actually doing is constructing some collineations of this finite projective plane. And then as a consequence, he gets this construction of perfect difference sets, which are more, which for H equal two are the same as sit on sets. It's interesting. It kind of reminds me of this paper by Smith from the 50s that Dweer and company recently discovered about uh, the rank of uh, the P rank of the incidence matrix between points and hyperplanes in the projective space. And, and they kind of use similar arguments in some sense, and they managed to calculate precisely the rank of this matrix, which just becomes some kind of, well, some, some number of combinations or some number of putting balls in, in the urns, basically, which is just magic. Questions or comments, anyone? So I'm just curious, you mentioned, so, you mentioned the relationship to projective geometries. Finite fields are also important in coding. Does anyone apply C down sets to coding? So, uh, Evans? Yeah, um, um, not to my not to my knowledge, not in that sense. Um, it uh, certainly it, it comes up when somebody was designing an antenna, right? In the old-fashioned antennas, where you would have a uh, one metal bar and then you would have perpendicular bars, uh, you want those perpendicular bars to be spaced like a Sidon set so that your, your antenna can resolve different frequencies. Um, and in a similar sort of thing, the, the uh, electrical engineers discovered it in the context of assigning radio frequencies. That uh, if your radio frequencies have a solution to uh, A plus B equals C plus D, then you get this kind of, uh, this opportunity where, where three channels could team up and interfere with a third channel. Um, so they were, there's a literature in electronics in the 50s at Bell Labs and such. With a, so this has applications, actually. It does have applications, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I drove through the very large array in New Mexico at one point, and you come over the hill and you see where they've got these 
uh, radio telescopes aligned. Uh, and I came over the hill and I noticed, ha, that's 0146, that's the don't say. Uh, and they're doing the same thing, right? They want the spacing between the telescopes to be, to have lots of different differences. Uh, and that's, you do that compactly with the Sidonsai. But even though they have applications, that's, you shouldn't hold it against it. <laughs> so here is, uh, you know, in the side of constructing Sidonsai, it's kind of uh, the most glaring thing that isn't out there to the best knowledge uh, is that there's no good construction of a Sidon set in Z mod P. Now, these were in Z mod and the modulus has to have some particular structure, but, but just Z mod P. How big can you take root P or, uh, or even that order of magnitude? Um, so that's kind of a, it's a glaring omission from the literature. Z mod easiest. The problem you mentioned that I find most embarrassing that we can't solve is the uh, uh, anything saying something intelligent about the sit on set constructed by the greedy, al greedy algorithm that uh, we should know about that. Yeah, people. Uh, uh, so one thing you might guess about uh, that set is that it uh, maximizes the sum of the reciprocals among all BD sets in the positive integers. Uh, and it's known that that's wrong. So that's the only thing uh, that's a something about the greedy set is that it's not to the one that makes the sum of the reciprocals as large as possible. Yeah, I agree. That's a frustratingly obvious problem. By the way, um, for the CAN conference, every day I keep getting in a couple more, you know, abstracts from people who want to give talks. So we are up right now to 95 speakers. And um, I believe that um, if there were a, uh, um, a, a, a listing in the Guinness Book of World Records, for the largest number of people lecturing at a number theory conference in the Zoom era, uh, we, <laughs> might, we might be doing pretty well. No idea. Uh, and I, we're going to start a little bit earlier than usual and end a little bit later than usual because we have quite a few people from Europe and Asia and uh, doesn't seem right to have them get up in the middle of the night to, uh, to give a talk about so this stretch things out a little bit. What is the maximum capacity you have for speakers? Well, of course, on Zoom, there's no maximum capacity. The, uh, so I have a, uh, a schedule, uh, you know, blocked out schedule, which has 100 slots for speakers. Uh, it's a very simple schedule. It starts at 8 in the morning and goes to 8 at night. Uh, every slot is a half hour, so it's basically a 25 minute talk and then five minutes for you know questions or whatever. So there's like four talks, that's two hours, and then a half hour break and four talks and a half hour break. And so, so there are like 20 talks in the day and that's, that's eight to eight, exactly. So I know um, uh, parallel sessions. I, I don't wanna have parallel sessions um, and um, so in principle, but you know, it's, it's on Zoom and no one is, you know, paying for a hotel room in Manhattan uh, and going broke <laughs> as a consequence. Uh, you know, if we wanted to meet on Saturday or Sunday, we could. If we wanted to extend it, we could. If we want to get up early in the morning or stay awake a little bit later at night, we can. But at the moment, um, well, I haven't hit my 100 yet. And um, though since the conference is, uh, almost, uh, well, about three and a half, yeah, three and a half weeks away. And there are invitations that are outstanding that people haven't replied to, so we'll see. But, um, but it's actually really very interesting. Um, like for example, on sit-on sets, there actually is a huge amount of work that's been done recently on sit-on sets. And uh, we could have like a whole mini conference within the conference just on sit-on sets. 
there are probably, uh, I don't know, eight to 10 talks just on that. Uh, with, and, and really interesting new results uh, and on other things as well. So uh, it's just curious how these things work. Uh, Mel, can I ask a question? Of course. Uh, the people that do computations with Sidon sets, are, are there any programs that are available for Maple or Sage or Paris to uh, uh, do the construction, the Bose Chola construction? I mean, that seems, uh, it's such a natural thing. I'm wondering if someone has worked out an algorithm to, to do the, uh, the actual calculations. Yeah. Kevin, do you uh, know? So um, I have written stuff that, uh, that will do it in Mathematica. Uh, I'm not sure how easily I could find it. Um, the, the finite field, uh, when I was heavy into this, like 10, 15 years ago, uh, the finite field package in Mathematica was really buggy uh, and would give wrong answers occasionally. Okay. Um, uh, so, so I had to kind of roll my own, and it wasn't very fast. But uh, I mean, it should be a straightforward thing to do in something like a, like GAP, maybe where you've got finite field arithmetic, right? Just there naturally. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah, I would be curious to uh, to see how it actually how it operates. Uh, I mean, the one thing that came to mind when I was working on finite fields is. I, this uniqueness of a finite field, you know, how do you get away from that? And finite fields are unique in the sense that they are the residue class field of an unramified extension of QP. So if you want to go a step higher, you take, for example, a quadratic extension of an unramified extension, and then you operate in the uh, ring of integers and you move out by, uh, a maximal ideal, you no longer get a finite field, but you get a sort of a ring extension, a quadratic ring extension of a finite field. And I, I just get the impression that some of these constructions that Chola and the Bose came up uh, could be imitated there, but I have no, no real sense for how, uh, how that would, uh, would work. Uh, so it, it's kind of interesting. I mean, I, I think that there is, uh, uh, going beyond the finite fields, one needs to look at these finite rings, perhaps quadratic extensions of finite fields and so on. That may have uh, the multiplicative group is no longer, uh, you have nilpotent elements in there. Uh, yeah. Mathematica is definitely not the tool for that exploration. Yeah. Yeah. I have an anecdote about that. I, I never relied on mathematical for the following reason. I was in Champagne when they uh, just got started with the coding of the interesting functions. And uh -huh. Grayson told me that in fact, and this I, I came up in court, that uh, Wolfram <laughs> wouldn't want to pay uh, very highly to the, uh, the guys that were doing the coding. So he would get a student from, uh, <laughs> from math to actually code, for example, the k vessel function without any regard for convergence, questions of convergence. And uh, very different from what happened with uh, Maple. Maple is more reliable. And Maple at one time, uh, were, I think they were exchanging ideas between these guys at IBM that uh, developed Axiom. And they had some very careful uh, algorithms for working with, uh, with rings and finite fields. And, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, it's, yeah, I, <laughs> I don't use mathematical for that particular reason. I, I think it's probably okay, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I think some of the coding for finite fields that uh, uh, Grayson eventually did were very reliable. I used some of them in mathematical. But, uh, but I, I'm curious, I mean, this, uh, uh, the construction of Bose and Chola is so, uh, such a natural, Thing. I'm just trying to figure out what would be the best uh, thing. Uh, you know, construction with finite fields requires you having your hands a primitive uh, polynomial. And from there on, it's uh, carrying out long division with polynomials. Uh, but that's not so effective. Uh, yeah. 
But at any rate, this is sort of interesting, yeah. yeah. Questions or comments? Evan, can you remind me who the very first construction you gave, the one with Erdish? Uh, Erdish and somebody. Erdish and Turan. So their first paper on the subject, 1941, give or take a year. Uh, they give their upper bound, uh, and then this is their lower bound, the uh, 2PK plus K squared. Yeah, the Erdos Turan paper, which I think Mel sent me That's a it. few weeks ago, it's a, it's a very nice, very short paper. It's a, like four, uh, three pages uh, or four pages, and it's very clearly uh, outlined. Yeah. 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 Three pages. Yeah. <laughs> three great theorems. <laughs> and at the end, they state uh, what is called the Erdos Turan conjecture that a um, uh, basis for the integers can't have a bounded representation function. So uh, they got a lot into this paper. And that problem is still open, is that right? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, they proved that the representation can't, function can't be eventually constant by using the uh, Fabry gap theorem. You have a, that's the only sort of non elementary part of their proof, but uh, their paper, but. Uh, yeah. Mel, I, 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 again, I don't remember things too well now, or, or but uh, you remember, I think Bayman uh, wrote something that was an extension of the Erdos Turan, and he had several PhD students work on that. Uh, I mean, he, so he, I he, think Bayman had some students who worked on what is called the Erdos Fuchs theorem. Yes, w yes. Right, right, which is that. Uh, if you take the average value of the representation function, uh, it, can, it can't be constant times x plus a small error term. Uh, and the Erdős Fuchs proof was analytic. And I know that Bateman had one student at Urbana who gave uh, a sort of technically elementary non-analytic proof of right. that. And also, and then some generalist, and they generalized it. And I think Bateman had a had a paper with a student, and maybe the student, but there were a few papers that came out of Bateman's uh, work there, right. a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, well, everyone, at least in uh, New Jersey, it's a very nice day. Uh, <laughs> it's been raining around here. Uh, go out and enjoy it. Uh, right. Thanks, everyone. Okay. All right. Very Thank good. You. Very nice. Bye, all. Yeah. Thank you. I can tell you it was snowing, but I'd be a liar. <laughs>
But uh, it may be worthwhile to look if I have some chance. Uh, I'll take a look at it during the summer and maybe come back. And yeah. I, I'm sort of curious uh, about this. But no, the, the both. The finite field sort of polynomial argument that Bose Chowler used is really very beautiful. It's just like this beautiful, simple idea, and it works like magic. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have to talk to Tutor. Right. So. Um, okay. I'll right. see Mel, you just next week. Mel, Mel, just yes. Just one little thing. Uh, so when I signed up for the Cant conference, I mean, I can't speak on Saturday or very late Friday afternoon. Right, no, um, we are not exactly Shomer Shabbat, but uh, <laughs> we don't uh, <laughs> don't have to overlap with Shabbat at all. Okay. <laughs> yes. Well, there's a finite probability if I don't tell you that. Yeah, no, that's true, that's true. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Hello. <laughs> yeah, hi. So I just wanted to make sure you were um, in good shape with respect to uh, this paper. Um, um, yeah, I, I think say, if you have any questions or problems, uh, I mean, you know the paper better than I because I've only just glanced <laughs> at it. But you know, during the week, if the questions come up, just send me an email and we can arrange to talk. Uh, sure, that that would be great. Uh, I was thinking. Um, I mean, the last couple of, of weeks have been like pretty busy in terms of uh, schoolwork and stuff like that. But um, so I, I, my plan is to prepare the slides. I guess by by Monday or in the weekend. And then if that's okay with you, I could send them over, and you could take a look look, sure. look, and look on the slides. I'll be okay. happy to. Right, and you know, perfect. as it turns out, in the course of preparing your slides, you figure out a way to improve their theorem and get a better result. Don't hesitate. You don't have to respect their work that much. If you can beat them uh, at their own game, that's that's completely sure, good. Sure. And yeah, if, if I get an improvement, then uh, maybe I can help you get the number of uh, the Kant presenters to 100. No, that'd be fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, no. By the way, so what classes are you taking this semester? Uh, I, I'm taking a graduate algebraic number theory course, uh, and I have a presentation tomorrow. So that's oh, okay. that's one of the reasons I right. yeah, that's a lot of work. But uh, other than that, I'm just taking humanities classes because of like what requirements to graduate. Uh, philosophy of math is one of them, which is pretty great. I mean, we're, who are you um, reading? What are you reading? Um, so um, the professor is um, Wilfred Zeke, if you've heard of him. Um, he's, I guess, pretty famous in, in that. So we're, we're just talking about uh, S-I-E-G. Um, so we're talking about uh, Dedekind and Hilbert and like their revolutions, obviously. And uh, I guess now we're getting into uh, Bourbaki. Oh, but you don't read, the, uh, for example, Wittgenstein or... No, no, no. no it's just what, else, what else are you taking? Uh, game theory, which is also a philosophy class, <laughs> I guess, uh, and and we're reading Osborne, I think, the theory of games or something like that, and uh, critical thinking, which again another philosophy class. That's pretty basic. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. Uh, good. Anyway, um, so if you send me something, I will look at it, and if you, any questions come up, just send me an email, and I can we can arrange a little Zoom chat. This okay. Perfect. Oh, uh, I was going to ask. So I'm, I'm not sure. Should I, should I, pres uh, like, I think in the article, they, one of the, I guess, sub chapters is on um, the Lynch storm bound. Mm -hmm. Should I present that or um, no? no because... It's up to you. But, you know, you yeah. keep in mind that um, uh, whenever you're giving uh, a seminar, even if it's a seminar in number theory, mm -hmm. you know, most of the number theorists won't know what you're talking about. Because it's a huge field in the you know summer, okay. one, everyone knows something, yeah. but uh, it's always the case that the majority of the audience has only the vaguest idea what about whatever topic is being discussed. So the more um, the easier, the simpler you can make it, the better. At least that's my point of view. Because, okay. You know, it's more important that people understand a little than you don't want to try impress anyone with how smart you are and you know how sophisticated is the stuff you're discussing. So. Okay. Perfect. Okay, take care. Yeah. Thank All you right. so much. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.